things look evil. Here's a Mrs. Bryant describing her encounter with the men in black. Were they Negroes? No, no, they didn't have Negroid features. Their face seems kind of pointed. You know, pointed noses, pointed chin, high cheekbones. There was a kind of evil look about them. I was afraid I was going to get robbed or attacked. Mrs. Bryant again commenting on their voices. Well, it was all pretty silly. They just wanted to know my name, where I was from, what I did for a living, things like that. Sometimes it was hard to understand them. Their voices were kind of sing-songy and high-pitched. It was like listening to a phonograph record played at the wrong speed. Get any idea how much that stings? Sure. Real nice. But then at the last time I elbowed a friend. Witnesses report impossible acrobatic maneuvers. Here's Mr. Keel talking about Mrs. Bryant and cattle mutilators on her farm. Had she ever caught the culprits in the act? Several times, he said. I'd see them out in the field and go after them with a shotgun, but they always got away. They're tall men and they wear white coveralls, which is kind of stupid because they really stand out in the dark. And they could certainly run and jump. I've seen them leap over high fences from a standing start. The preferred automobile of the men in black appears to be large, out of date, and black. Here's Connie Carpenter's retelling of an attempted abduction and the cars the men in black are often seen in. She said she could positively identify it as a 1949 Buick. The driver was a clean cut young man of about 25 and was wearing a colorful mod shirt, no jacket, despite the cold weather. His thick black hair was neatly combed and he appeared to be very suntan. He spoke with no noticeable accent. The car, though nearly 20 years old, was so well kept it looked like new. Even the interior had a look of newness about it. Here's a description from a college student named Tom. It was a very old Buick, he reported, but it was very well kept. It looked brand new. It even smelled brand new. Unlimited technology from the whole universe, and we cruise around in a Ford POS. These men in black left behind little trace. Mr. Mallette took down the license number on their Volkswagen, and when Mary had the police check it out, it proved to be non-existent. This business with the license numbers was repeated over and over, and in many places. Witnesses would carefully note the plates on the black Cadillac and mysterious panel truck, but when the police ran a routine check, the computers came up with a blank. Four men in black arrived to an elderly woman's home in April of 1967, immediately after a severe rainstorm. They had high cheekbones and very red faces, like a bad summer, she told me. They were very polite, but they said that my land belonged to their tribe and that they were going to take it back. What frightened me was their feet. They didn't have a car. They must have walked up that muddy hill, but their shoes were spotlessly clean. There was no trace of water or mud where they walked in my house. You'll dress only in attire specially sanctioned by MIB Special Services. You'll conform to the identity we give you. Eat where we tell you, live where we tell you. From now on, you'll have no identifying marks of any kind. You will not stand out in any way. Your entire image is crafted to leave no lasting memory with anyone you encounter. The Mothman Prophecies, an exceedingly boring movie released in 2002, was loosely based on the book. In the movie, the main character named John Klein, played by the exceedingly stale Richard Gere, was loosely based on John Keel. Although there are a few parallels between the experiences of the main character and those of John Keel, the movie for the most part does not delve into the book's more paranormal content. The movie has no trace of men in black, UFOs, or even the appearance of a mothman. The viewer is forced to be content with drawings and as for descriptions of these mothmen, nothing except their large, red glowing eyes are mentioned. It's clear that the film was made for middle-aged women with no interest in UFOs, the paranormal, or well-written stories. In fact, the only thing the movie got right was the bridge disaster and an alien who used a contactee to speak directly to John Keel. Aside from that, the movie was void of any of the book's true content and focus. Since the movie was little help, what does the book say about these mothmen? Descriptions of these mothmen throughout the book are similar. Here's a few excerpts. Here's a report from the late 1800s out of Brooklyn, New York. He had wings and performed aerial acrobatics over the heads of the crowds of sunbathers at Coney Island. A Mr. W. H. Smith first reported these strange flights in a letter to the New York Sun, September 18, 1887. The creature was not a bird, but a human winged form. He maneuvered at an altitude of about 1,000 feet, sporting bat wings and making swimming-like movements. Witnesses claimed to have seen his face clearly. He wore a cruel and determined expression. 
Here's a description of the Mothman from a West Virginia girl driving home from church in 1966. It was at least seven feet tall and very broad. The thing that attracted her attention was not its size, but its eyes. It had, she said, large, round, fiercely glowing red eyes that focused on her with hypnotic effect. As she slowed, her eyes fixed on the apparition. A pair of wings unfolded from its back. They seemed to have the span of about 10 feet. It was definitely not an ordinary bird, but a man-shaped thing which rose slowly off the ground, straight up like a helicopter, silently. Its wings did not flap in flight. This report is from a group of soldiers in Vietnam in 1969. All of a sudden, I don't know why, we all three looked out there in the sky and we saw this figure coming towards us. We saw what looked like wings, like a bat, only it was gigantic compared to what a regular bat would be. After it got close enough so we could see what it was, it looked like a woman, a naked woman. She was black, her skin was black, her body was black, the wings were black, everything was black. But it glowed, it glowed in the night, kind of a greenish cast to it. These descriptions of the Mothman bear an uncanny resemblance to demons depicted in the dark and medieval ages. In medieval depictions of demons, the beings were humanoid, but had wings. In fact, demons and the devil were commonly depicted as giant man-like bats throughout the period. Over and over again, these malevolent supernatural beings were adorned with the bodies of men, but wings of bats. Here's just a few depictions of so-called devils from the time. But the Mothman prophecies had traces of yet another creature of so-called myth and legend, vampires. Vampires have long been associated with giant bats and hypnotic powers, but there's something else. The men in black themselves. Witnesses describe hypnotic gazes, pointed features of the chin and nose, high cheekbones, jet black hair, and long tapering fingers. These are the general attributes of every Dragula character Hollywood has ever regurgitated. Here's what a witness said about shaking the hands of one of these mysterious characters. The rear door opened and a man climbed out with a big grin on his face. He was about 5 feet 8 inches tall, with dark skin and oriental eyes. He solemnly shook hands with the girl. His hand was as cold as ice, she would later report. Here's a girl named Jane, describing her encounters with a quote-unquote vampire woman who she first met working as a librarian. In early June, Jane began to see the librarian wherever she went. On June 6th, while walking through a local department store, the woman appeared behind a chess rack. She wore the same old-fashioned clothes and tried to speak to Jane in quote-unquote broken English. There was something wrong about her speech and movement. It was as if she were dead, Jane said. When asked if she lived around Babylon, the woman laughed in a strange hysterical way, like an emotionally disturbed person. Like flying saucers, it delighted in chasing cars, a very unbird-like habit, and it seemed to have a penchant for scaring females who were menstruating. Another UFO hairy monster peculiarity. Elsewhere throughout the Ohio Valley, dogs, cows, and horses were dying suddenly and mysteriously, usually from surgical-like incisions in their throat. Animal disappearances and death go hand in hand with UFO phenomena. The most puzzling aspect of these deaths is the absence of blood. Often the carcasses seem drained of all blood. The wounds don't bleed. No blood is in evidence in the grass or dirt where the victims lay. Two points confounding investigators have been the absence of blood and footprints. Even on warm days with the carcass freshly killed, there has been no bleeding on or around the animal. Some believe the cattle were drained of blood. No human tracks have been detected near each mutilation, even in fresh snow. Europe has been plagued with phantom animal killers for generations. Sweden had a plague of this sort of thing in 1972. The extensive vampire legends of Middle Europe were undoubtedly based on such incidents. Vampires were cloaked beings, often accompanied by strange aerial lights who could paralyze humans and animals in their tracks. There are even more recent reports of vampirism, 